Well, here we are in the final episode for now. I guess episode four. Um... <laughs> we don't need to see a recap. We pretty much just uh, denied that we were going to repent for our family's sins. You know, a big deal. You open your eyes. It's a new day. Last night seemed so far away. You can almost pretend the horrors you witnessed in the annex were nothing but nightmare, chased away by the harsh morning light. But you know that the furious spirit of Charles Shaw Jr. yet lingers, locked behind the doors of the town hall, still tied to the earth by its hatred of you and Tabitha. An involuntary shudder runs down your spine. But your thoughts are interrupted by the buzz of your phone on the nightstand. Hey, have you heard from Stella? I haven't been able to get a hold of her. Thought she might have at least checked in with you. You check your messages. There's nothing from Stella. <laughs> I'm sure she's fine. I don't know. I don't love the thought of her out there on her own with all the weird shit that's been happening in town. I know we haven't exactly got along, but we should meet up in town and look for her together. Looks like you have your morning plans in order. Hey, possums. Possums stare up at you. They both have bread now. That's nice. You wave at them. They continue to stare up at you blankly in response. Bye, possums. Close the drawers. This is their home now, and there's nothing you can do to change that. <gasps> you make your way to the closet. There's no denying it. The doll moved at some point since her most recent visit. But your long dead relative's creepy doll isn't the only thing that's different. Someone was in here. And judging by the residue that was left behind, you're pretty sure you know the culprit. That means he was in your room. But was he just was he there while you were out the previous day, or did he enter while you slept, unaware, just a few feet away? Something to mull over for the rest of the day. It's time to face your cousin. Find her in the kitchen, her shoulders hunched in a tight ball of anxiety. Jeez, have you showered since you got in here? I could smell you from the other room. Uh, it's fine, it's fine. There's more important things going on right now than your hygiene. They're striking, this week of all weeks, as if I didn't have enough on my plate already. Your cousin's posture is unsurprisingly much tenser than usual. It's possible the strike is even worse than she thought it would be. It probably won't be long before she bolts out of here. Does it even matter how the strike plays out? Any resolution would merely treat the symptoms of the disease, rotting the heart of Scarlet Hollow. For things to stand any chance of getting better, there's something deeper you still have to fully uncover. Yeah, you know what I just said. The strike is just a symptom of the rot in this place, Tabitha. If we don't treat the underlying disease, it won't even matter who wins. Okay, yes. I know that we saw a literal ghost last night, but this is important, Jay. This isn't just about me. This town relies on the mines. Look, it's not doing well. I wish people could pay more, and I wish I could give them more time off. I just need more time to pull things out of the fire. I don't want to be the bad guy here. You, you get that, right? How are you feeling about the strike? You can be honest with me. Conflicted. It's going to be tough, and despite what a lot of people would have you believe, I'm not relishing the opportunity to pick a fight with my men. I don't think many people would take pleasure in breaking strikes. Perlan would have, but that's not me. I don't know. It's complicated. Everything is so complicated. Do you know what the strikers even want? I haven't seen a list of demands. I'm sure it's just the usual. I promise you that if any one of them were in my shoes for a month, they'd be singing a different tune. I'm glad we left Charlie down there. Yeah, me too, and I don't care if Grandma Eddie killed him. The past is the past, and neither of us had anything to do with it. We can always build a new town hall. We can never get back lost years. Any news about the trapped kids? We have confirmation of at least one voice down there. The boys have been digging around the clock. 
don't think it'll be long before we can pull all this unpleasantness behind us. Of course, that hasn't stopped the kid's mom from being on my ass nonstop. I'm doing everything I can, but she's the kind of person who needs someone to blame. And I'm an easy target. I've dawdled long enough. Stay safe. No more hijinks. But let me know if you get in trouble, okay? Tabitha slips past you, her heavy boots thudding down the hall as she marches away to face her employees. Time to figure out the rest of your day. No, the PB and J hate her. I can't do it. You head to the front door and begin to trek to the, the town below. Ah, it's raining. Or not. <laughs> the sun shines down through a thin layer of clouds, illuminating the path in a watery gray light. Glimpses of pale figures dot your periphery. You haven't seen ditchlings in the middle of the day before. They're getting bolder. As you continue to trek to town, you pause to stare out the mountain range beyond the holler, contemplating a world that's blissfully unaware of the danger threatening the citizens of this tiny town. The world outside feels less real with each passing day, as the strange reality of what's happening in Scarlet Hollow gently uproots what you'd always taken to be the truths of our world. Your everyday worries seem distant, overshadowed by a fear and dread that hasn't stopped building up since the moment you stepped off that bus. It isn't long until you journey from the estate is over, and you once again find yourself on the main street of Scarlet Hollow. Hey, you made it! I still haven't heard from Stella, and I've already seen a bunch of those ditchling things scurrying around in broad daylight. I know my mom said they're harmless, but... Kanika stops mid-sentence and eyes you with skepticism and concern. She knows you haven't showered. <laughs> we should start looking for her. <laughs> Supposed to see her mom at some point today. Maybe she'll finally shed some light on things. I'm not sure what she's planning to tell you today that she couldn't have told all of us last night. Maybe she's going to read your fortune. I should probably stop making fun of her whole new misty age, <laughs> new age mystic vibe. A lot's happened in the past couple days. Still, there's plenty of time for tea after we look for Stella. I don't want to talk to you. Might as well start by checking her house. Let's go. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep on talking about this. Supposed to get tea with your mom today. Maybe she'll have some ideas. Sure, we can humor her. She's probably gonna give you some rock or bundles or herbs for protection or something, which might actually work. Who knows? Guess there's only one way to find out. The bells of the general store chime welcomingly as the two of the you enter. Kanika! There you are! You were supposed to stay in bed today, remember? And hello, Jay. Hope you're sufficiently recovered from last night's fiasco. Sorry, Mom. It's just that Stella's missing and I... Stella can take care of herself. Unlike you, you need bed rest and lots of fluid. You don't need to go running around town spreading that cold of yours. Go on, get up to bed. I'll be up in a minute with more tea. I thought you had some kind of important thing to talk to Jay about. I'm really feeling okay. I want to hear what you had to say to him. I've just been doing tea reading. Haven't those always bored you to tears? Hmm. Okay, you're right. I'm not feeling well. I really should lie down. Bye, Jay. Ah, got rid of Kanika early. Kanika turns and heads towards the stairs without saying another word. Couldn't help but notice something stiff and quiet in her demeanor as she obeyed her mother's stern command. There's something off here. It's as if Kanika's spirit dimmed at Sybil's words. Shall we? Sybil motions towards the tea room. What did you do to Kanika? Do? It almost sounds like you're accusing me of something. The only thing I did to tell her that she should rest, as any mother would, and she listened, as any child would. We'll just go talk to her. Please, have a seat. I'll bring you a fresh cup. Take a seat at the small table at the edge of the room. It's dark here. Only a sliver of sunlight is able to filter through the heavy curtains, supplemented by the bright grow lights over the plant in the corner. Sybil joins you at the table and places a cup in front of you that smells light and citrusy, with an undercurrent of decaying earth. I'll be able to do a reading once you're done. Until then, how about we just chat? The other day you promised to tell me, what was it, uh, unsavory tales of my mom's youth? 
I most certainly did, though I might have been exaggerating a bit for dramatic effect. I'm prone to do that. And in town this side, you get to know everybody, no matter the age difference might be. Vivian was a little younger than me, which meant I always had a certain older sister instinct about her. Her family wasn't good to her. Perlan was a lot like your next great or your great grandmother, Edwardine. That's just to say, she was not a very kind woman. Similar to Tabitha, but with more social grace and considerably more hatred for her fellow man. But your mother wasn't a shrinking violet either. She was just as stubborn as any other Scarlet, so her family choosing her as their punching bag made her into quite the rebel. What do you know about my grandma? I'm afraid there isn't much I can tell you. I think there were two in that generation. The eldest died when the girls were still children. Edward Dean never spoke about them, nor did your mother. I feel like I know a lot about the women in my family, but what about the men? Did they even exist? I suppose they just haven't been very noteworthy since Edward Dean took over the mines. Her husband died a long time ago, and to be quite honest, I can't even recall his name. Might have been Stuart or something just as forgettable. From what Vivian said, her father was some teenage fling that ended once her grandmother found out she was pregnant. I'm fairly certain it was similar for Vivian, though she was much older, and I believe she was the one who ended it, what with skipping town and all. Well, it sounds like she skipped town, but what happened when my mom found out she was pregnant? She came to me for advice. She was distraught. It was like she'd been handed a death sentence. Maybe it was fear from what had happened to her own mother. Maybe it was something else. But she seemed convinced she was in danger. Tabitha had already been born by then, of course, but she was born in wedlock, so I assumed your mother's worries had something to do with religion. Though the Scarlets weren't particularly religious, as far as I know. But the way Vivian was that night she came to me, it stuck in my mind. It always had me wondering what it was about your family that made her panic so much at the thought of having a baby. Why were Pearl Ann and my mom raised by Edwardine? What happened to their mother? Their entry into this world was violent, I'm afraid. Their mother was young, too young to be pregnant, especially with twins. She didn't survive the labor. <laughs> Take the tea, sipping it delicately. The citrus smell is fleeting, quickly replaced with the earthiness at its core, like you've taken a mouthful of dirt. But the aftertaste combines the two flavors into something soothing and medicinal, and you find yourself feeling more comfortable, and your muscles relaxing for the first time in days. There's something you don't like about the feeling. It's too soothing. You don't doubt that there's something magical at work in this blend. How did you wind up in Scarlet Hollow? Oh, my family's been in these hills for a long time. That's how I know so much of the local flora. Everything I've learned was handed down from generations of hill folk. There hasn't always been a reliable doctor up here, especially not one most folks could afford. They have to figure out their own medicine. What's with all the mystery and ritual? If you have something to tell me, just come out and say it. I'll need your tea leaves first. I have pieces of the puzzle, but the tea leaves should help to give me the full picture. Alright, whatever. I'll drink it. Close your eyes and take another sip. And then another. It's delightful. Simply delightful. The tea is gone before you know it. The small cup, empty, save for what's left of rehydrated leaves, coating the bottom. Oh good. Oh good. Glad you found the tea palatable enough to drink. I should do you some good. That's one of my more medicinal blends. Now on to business. Sybil takes the cup from you, staring thoughtfully down at the sludge. Oh dear, this doesn't bode well. You've got just about every warning that can fit in the bottom of a cup. Cross, kettle, hourglass. All of these mean death, misery, and difficulty and the hourglass ties it all together with definite urgency. It's fair to assume that this all has to do with whatever brought the ditchlings. Something is coming, and whether any of us can stop it, I'm not sure. But we may at the very least be able to figure out what it is. And there is a central figure here, a cat, an enemy lurking in plain sight. <laughs> oh, the cat's gotta be Pixel, or maybe it's uh, Fru Fru. Those are the two cats I know. Dear, the cat isn't a literal cat. Like I said, it's a symbol for an enemy lurking in plain sight. Probably a human enemy, but almost certainly not a cat. You don't have to figure out an answer right away. It often takes time for the mind to connect the dots. Best be on guard and keep vigilant that someone close to you isn't to be trusted. 
We know from the Ditchlings that something terrible is coming your way, and it's likely that it's connecting to some hidden enemy. Perhaps we can try to counteract whatever might be planned for you. Judging by what you told me last night, the stones, carvings, seals, whatever you want to call them, I think it's likely they have something to do with this. Until the cat reveals itself, it seems like your best course of action is to seek these carvings out. Piece together what you can from your visions, and arm yourself with information. Have you sensed any others around? Do you think you might be able to find another? Thoughts drift to that door yesterday, the one that seemed to draw you in, urging you deeper into the clinic. Even just remembering it is enough to tug at you, compelling you to return and open it to see what's on the other side. You can find Stella later, maybe you can even find her there. What's important now is finally seeing what's hidden in the clinic. I'll talk to you about it. I think I felt another in the clinic. That's good. If you can find your way inside and uncover another stone, that could give you a leg up on your adversary. You'll just have to be careful to avoid the doctor. Something tells me she won't take too kindly to you sniffing around her clinic. If I recall correctly, there's a hill that'll take you nearly all the way to the second story, and she never locks any of the doors up there. How <laughs> do you know that? Just in case that's helpful information. I think that's all the help I can offer. I hope this conversation has been illuminating, even if it just brought up more questions than giving any clear answers. You helped last night, why don't you go with me now? I may have been able to see through that spirit's illusions, but I'm not some kind of all-powerful entity. I'm an old woman, and I have trouble with my knees and my eyesight isn't what it used to be. In most situations, I'd be more of a liability than a helpful companion. Imagine if I'd been in those mines with you, some use I'd be, struggling to climb over rocks and ladders, throwing my back out from all the crouching. I get up to leave. Thank you again for humoring an old lady and stopping by for a chat. I wish you would have talked about Wayne. <laughs> with a small grunt of effort, Sybil gets up from the table, and you're escorted back to the door. And remember, be careful who you put your trust in. According to your tea, the cat is getting ready to pounce, and merely being ready for it might not be enough. Sybil closes the door to the tea room, the bells of its door strangely flat in the stale air of the nearly empty general store. I'm going to the clinic. That boy's never going to stop playing this damn gacha game. You make your way up the familiar hill, past the rows of ragged houses that make up Scarlet Hollow's residential area. It isn't long before you find yourself outside Dr. Kelly's clinic, its secrets enticing you to find a way in. Even at the bottom of the hill, you can already feel the presence. It's like a magnet has been fixed to your ribcage, gently tugging you forward, guiding you towards whatever emits this compulsive frequency. You can see the hill Sybil was talking about, wrapped around the back of the old hospital like a stone blanket. It should take you directly up to the second floor, and the unlocked doors of the terrace. You found at times that if you haven't wished to be seen, there's nothing stopping you from remaining hidden. Graveyards, abandoned buildings, old tunnels, you've been in all sorts of strange and unusual places without incident. For some reason tonight, Dr. Achilles' clinic feels no different. You haphazardly make your way up the old wooden stairs of the clinic's wraparound porch, taking steps in strange patterns. To an outside observer, you might appear to be drunk, but there's an unconscious method to your conscious madness, though even you would be hard-pressed to describe it. But there's no creak or moan of ancient wood as you make your way to the door. Silence. You push the door open, slowly, and slip in. You can see the doc at the desk in uh, some room down the hall. She hasn't noticed you. You shut the door silently, watching her closely. You're in the clinic, free to explore as you please. Or rather, you're free to explore as you please. You can feel that odd sensation again, the nagging pull of whatever it is that wanted you to find it. You're here now, and it knows you're here, and you know exactly what it is, another stone carving, eager to show you its secrets. You've been caught by its gravity, an overwhelming curiosity guiding you around a corner and towards a dark doorway under the stairs. It's been left ajar, as if inviting you to enter. The light clicks on, you're in the morgue. Jay, what are you doing in the morgue? God. <laughs> Am I, uh, interrupting something? 
No, no, I was just uh, practicing, I guess. Sometimes they come down here just to rehearse. Rehearse, you say? Good one. <laughs> the words seem distant to you. The tugging is strong down here. You can almost feel yourself slipping into a trance, and your eyes wander to the back wall of the morgue. You need to see what's back there. You touch the wall. It feels disappointingly solid under your palms. Hey, are you okay? You feel Reese's hand gently shake your shoulder. For a moment, the thing on the other side of the blank wall, white wall loosens its pull on you. You kind of look possessed there for a second. You good? Make him understand. Use your words. Don't let this fervor consume you. Be present in the moment. You inhale deeply and take in your surroundings. You can't help but notice that one of the body storage doors is labeled Perlan Scarlet. You step forward and pull out the drawer. So this is your Aunt Perlan, coal baroness of the Scarlet Mines and local she-devil that it seemed no one, not even her own daughter, was able to mourn. This is not the first corpse you've seen, but it feels the same as any other. She's an empty body now, the warmth and energy of a life now dissipated. The same as your mother was, and the same as you'll be one day. Cold air rises from her bluish skin, her vacant, filmy eyes staring up at nothing. You try to imagine what she may have looked like alive and breathing, slinging subtle insults at the sounds folk, but it's hard to picture any expression on a face so stiff and cold with death. You could sure she didn't walk off? You had to check for signs of murder, just wondering. Oh, uh, no, sorry. Not unless there's a meat cleaver sticking out of his head or something. Doesn't look like it's the case, though. Just looks like an old lady. Having seen what there was to see, you slide the drawer back in and close it. The mines had a stone carving the other night, as did Oscar's house yesterday. They've been giving me visions, and I can sense one on the other side of this wall. I need to see it. He glances back at the wall. You're really serious, aren't you? This is probably a bad idea, but... You really need to get in there. I'm pretty sure there's an emergency axe somewhere upstairs. I just need to get the dock out of her hair. It should take two seconds. Get the dock out of her hair? Yeah, if I say she, I'm sick and I need something, she'll drop whatever she's doing and do it for me. Sure if I wear to get it out of the house. And most of the time it's true anyway. Thanks for understanding. Don't mention it. If there's anything I can do to actually be useful, I'm happy to help. Be right back. He strides past you, his long legs moving swiftly. He seems excited, his usual dour demeanor replaced with an uncharacteristic pep when faced with the prospect of sneaking around and tearing down walls. We hear a soft voice fluttering in, the, in through the open doorway at the top of the stairs, a hoarse and sickly edge added for effect as he speaks to his mother. Hey, Mom. He coughs gently. Reese, I didn't know you were awake. I still feel like shit, but I think I can finally try to keep some juice down. It looks like we're all out, though. Really? I thought I just picked up some. I've got an errand to run on Main Street anyway. I'll go pick up some orange juice and some ginger ale, too. That would be awesome. Sorry to ask. I know you're probably busy. It's no problem. It doesn't take long. Don't do anything too strenuous while I'm gone. Just lie in bed till I get back. Thanks, Mom. I'll take it easy. You hear her footsteps move down the hall, and then the front door opening and closing. It worked! The theatric grasp has left his voice, his voice, excitement rising in its place. Come on up, we don't have long till she's back. As you step out of the morgue, you relax. The extra space between you and the carving has weakened its hold on you, and with it, your desperation to claw your way through the wall and unveil it. One of those emergency fire axes, so it should be pretty obvious wherever it is, though I'm not sure where she would be keeping it. I'll show you around, let's try the doc's office first. You make your way to the doorway of her now vacant office. I don't see an axe in here. He's right. A cursory glance reveals nothing but stacks of paper and cabinets of medical supplies. But something on the desk catches your eye. Some sort of records with your family's name on them. He steps in the doorway, turning to watch you leaf through the documents. Find something interesting? They're your family's death certificates. Enoch Scarlett, born September 9th, 1887, died August 20th, 1957, age 69, 
Cause of death, fall from cliff. This one has a coroner's report attached. Organ sustained impact injuries, lacerations to the neck and body consistent with fall from great height. Whoa, an actual autopsy report. Looks ancient. Edward Dean Scarlett, born April 9th, 1913, died February 12th, 2003, aged 89, cause of death, heart failure, signed by her great-granddaughter Pearl Ann Scarlett. Pretty normal, almost made it to 90, died of a normal old person illness. Cause of death, sleep apnea, discovered by her daughter Tabitha, Chrysanthemum Scarlett, no autopsy performed. Tabitha's middle name is Chrysanthemum? I wonder who cursed her with that mouthful. I feel like that was forbidden knowledge. Quickly flip through a few other Scarlets whose names aren't quite as familiar. Theodore Scarlet, born May 24th, 1890, died 1918, age 28, cause of death, crushed in mind collapse, body not recovered, signed by his brother Enoch Scarlet. Joseph Scarlet, born 1914, died June 7th, 1944. Louis Scarlet, born 1920, died June 6th, 1944. Both killed at Normandy in the line of duty. These must have been Edward Dean's brothers. Certificate of fetal death, infant boy, Andrew Charles Scarlet, de delivered April 3rd, 1945, stillbirth, mother, Edward Dean Scarlet. Cause of death, complications during birth, no doctor present, home burial. Alexandra Scarlet, born December 12th, 1947, died August 20th, 1957, age 9, missing, presumed dead, signed by mother, Edward Dean Scarlet. Alexandra, the owner of the doll, so she went missing. Mary Bell Scarlet, born September 3rd, my birthday, 1946, died October 30th, 1963, age 17. Cause of death, complications during childbirth, signed by her mother, Edward Dean Scarlet. Wow, that's a lot of kids to outlive. Reese's eyes flick up to the doorway, and a second later you hear the sound of the front door handle being turned. His hand on you is in shoulder er, his hand is on your shoulder before you even register what's happening, and you're pushed back and out of view of the front door. Shit, I'm not supposed to be in here. We gotta hide. He hurries to the closet door, motioning you inside. You slip past him and squish yourself into what little space is available in the nearly full closet. Reese is close on your heels. You let him in. Together you listen as the doctor makes her way to some room deeper in the clinic. In the silence of the tiny closet, every breath seems loud to you, as if you could expect Dr. Kelly to hear it from wherever she was across the house. We better wait a second, just in case. The two of you stand in tense silence, both crammed into the suffocating closet, taking shallow breaths as if she could hear you breathing from the other side of the building. But the footsteps soon return. Dr. Kelly makes her way back towards the hall of your hiding place. Creaking floorboards broadcasting her location, all the way to the hallway just outside your hiding spot. The footsteps return, they get louder, approaching the office door, and then they stop. Much to your relief, she opens another door, leaving the main clinic. We're in the clear. Probably only got a minute or two till she comes back. Let's make it count. The medical supply room is probably our best bet. If any of the other rooms in the clinic are likely to have a fire axe, it's probably the room full of chemicals. This way. He motions you down the hallway, slipping through the slightly ajar door of what you assume to be the supply room. Yes, there it is. Keys, keys. Here we go. He rushes over to the cabinet that contains a bright red axe, pulling the glass door open. Your axe, and my axe. A splash of brown catches your eye. There's a small sprig of what almost looks like a furry berry, like furry berries, with a wide eight-pronged leaf still attached at the base. The end of the sprig is a leaking sap onto the countertop. It's fresh. Now we can. He stops mid-sentence as he notices you staring at the plant. He stoops to pick it up. Does she make her own medicine? He puts it down, but not before breaking off a berry and sliding it into his pocket. I don't think she's allowed to do that. She's not a pharmacist. This room is just for storing stuff she ordered for patients from a pharmacist in Brevard. Why would she be making her own? Before you can answer, the two of you hear something in the distance and turn to listen intently. That was the door from the front of the house. Come on, if we can hurry, we can get you back downstairs. I'll run interference. Go downstairs, quick. You can hear her approaching now, floorboards creaking in the hallway on the other side of the office. You follow Reese's instructions, once again stirring down at the basement stairs, letting the pull of the stone carving guide you back to the morgue. 
Dr. Kelly's voice flitters down from above. I was right. We did already have juice. It was just in the back of the fridge, but there's no harm in having extra. What are you doing in the clinic? I thought I told you to go rest. Oh, I'm just gonna go chill in the morgue. I got my speakers, so if you hear some weird sounds, that's just my music. I'll be sure to put in earplugs to drown all the industrial clanging you listen to. You know I'm not the biggest fan of you spending time down there. It can't be good for your mental health to hang out in a refrigerator for corpses. Do you at least have a blanket this time? Yeah, I'll be fine. It's just a change of scenery. My room feels too claustrophobic right now. Okay, I'll let you know when it's time for dinner. You hear the door close and the sound of Reese descending the stairs to join you in the fluorescent lit room below. Hey. I should warn you. Something spooky is going to happen when we break down that wall. Reese smiles. Good. Feels like I've been missing out lately. Stop asking questions. It's time to see what's on the other side of the wall. May I take the first blow? Go for it. You approach the far end of the morgue, axe practically singing through the air as you strike the wall. The first cut offers a surprising amount of resistance. There's some structure behind it, some wood frame holding it in place, trying to stand between you and what waits for you on the other side. You stagger back from the massive hole in the wall and admire your effort. Holy shit! The splintered edge of the, uh, the splintered edge frames a dark passage, seemingly cut deep into the side of the cliff, cold seeping from a forgotten place into the already frigid morgue. Reese coughs as he takes a better look at what lies just beyond the wound in the wall. There's a whole hallway back there. Thick, stale air leaks from the hole, filling the morgue with an earthly mildew smell, like the room is slowly filling with dirt. With the stink of the grave-like room beyond comes an even stronger compulsion. You step forward, and you climb into the hole. This is wild. I had no idea any of this was here. An entire hospital wing rotting away for decades behind some flimsy drywall. Yeah, I'm going to pass out when we find this thing. Don't be too worried about me. I'll be fine. <laughs> Thanks for the heads up. You step forward into the unknown. You don't bother to retrieve the axe. The final wall concealing the carving is rotten, water damage having eaten away at the wood over the course of unknowable years. The planks nearly reduced to sawdust. You tear into it. Enoch, I thought you weren't going to come. I was worried you'd leave me here forever. They said there's nothing they can do. I'll never use my legs again. Enoch, what am I gonna do? Calm down, Teddy. These doctors don't know what they're talking about. I've been doing my own research. I found us an alternative. We won't have to worry about anything from here on out. I promise. I want to talk with the witch. A witch? But that's nonsense. It's all right. It's all sorted. We're taking you home today, and everything will be resolved by this time next week. That's right, doctor. At this point, I think it's safe to say his body was never recovered. Whoever it was, or whoever it was who claimed to be Theodore, it wasn't him. It wasn't even paralyzed, as it turns out. Just some grifter trying to take advantage of the tragedy. Everything goes black. Your vision swims back into focus. It takes a solid second or two to reorient yourself. You're in an unfamiliar bed. Reese leans against the far wall, eyeing you with concern and curiosity. Hey, I was worried you'd slipped into a coma or something. <laughs> Tore down a wall like a wild animal, found some weird carving and collapsed. I think you might have had some kind of seizure. I know you warned me this might happen, but are you okay? Does Dr. Kelly know I'm here? No, I snuck you back into the house while she was busy in the medical storage room. Figured you wouldn't want to come to, uh, want to, come to in the morgue. I had a vision. Like a hallucination? I have those sometimes too. Used to have them a lot as a teen. Always just weird little things. Like my hands would go wrong. Or hands would look, <laughs> look wrong. Or my neck would seem too long. Or the room would feel smaller. At least one of those death records is murky. I don't think Teddy died in the mine collapse. My family has secrets. That's a weird thing to cover up. But it's not too surprising. An old family like that usually has at least a few secrets. But hopefully that's all ancient history. It's not like it's easy to cover up deaths these days, right? So, uh, what now? I might be stuck down here for a little bit. Duck is on the warpath up there. 
I refuse to take my medicine, and she's not happy about it. But after I looked this up, there's no way I was going to take anything she gave me. She's been poisoning me for years. I went ahead and blocked my door so she can't get down here. Now we just have to wait her out. Why would your mom poison you? I don't know. But the internet keeps saying this is castor bean. It's used to make ricin, a super deadly poison that causes some of my exact symptoms. And death, usually. The thing I can't figure out is whether she's been trying to kill me slowly, or she just likes keeping me sick enough to be dependent on her. Either way, I don't think I ever had an illness. I think the illness was me growing up and becoming less easy to control. She sure found a cure for that. Ricin is really bad. How are you not dead? I don't know. Maybe it's low enough dose, or maybe I developed the tolerance. But I think the fact that I feel more and more alive by the minute is enough proof that she was keeping me sick. I don't even need solid evidence. We need to get out of here. Who knows what she'll do when she finds out you know what you know. Where would we go? The only person I know has a car is Kanika. She's not answering her phone. I don't know anyone else. I don't have any other family to go to. I never even finished high school. When I get out of this house, I don't know how I can make sure I don't wind up right back down here. Hey, one step at a time. Let's just start wait by waiting out your mom and getting out of here. I shouldn't call her my mom. As far as I'm concerned, she's forfeited that title. I don't even think I should call her doctor. She's just some woman now. Can't wait for her to be in the rear view mirror the rest of my life. We'll see if you can wait her out. She doesn't fall asleep by 10. We can figure something else out. These windows are supposedly shatterproof, which she always says was for burglars, but I assume it was yet another way to keep me boxed in. But we can try to break them anyway. The distraction seems like a good idea. As you can probably tell, I'm getting a little jittery. Maybe it's the lack of poison in my system for the first time in years, or the fact that my whole perception of reality has been turned on its head. Probably a combo. It doesn't feel awful, to be honest. I believe you owe me a showing of Shinochi death blood. I believe I do. Reese gets the movie set up and he joins you on the bed. Let me know if it gets to be too much for you. I'm not a great judge of how other people will react to the sort of things I watch, but I definitely don't want you to feel uncomfortable. This is a slow burn of a movie, but the dread is managing to build <laughs> is palpable in the room. Or maybe that's just how it feels down here all the time. What with the grisly paintings, lack of lighting, center block walls, and of course the fact that the woman currently lurking upstairs has been poisoning her son since his teens. I've seen a couple of this director's other films. They're all interesting. This is probably the best introduction to his work. The way it jump cuts to seemingly unrelated TV show recordings that then wind up trying, tying back into the narrative adds a level of realism and depth to the world that I find really engrossing. It's found footage used to its fullest. I can't believe I'll be able to just do things from here on out. Like watch movies with another person. Or talk to people. Ever. You can hear the difference in energy now that Reese hasn't had his daily dose of poison. He's uncharacteristically chatty. Clearly not used to t talking to another person. Let alone when he has energy to carry on a long conversation. Something is changing inside of him. You know, maybe she's poisoning him for a reason. Maybe she knows something. <laughs> Gotta keep him under control. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. First we have to get out of this basement. That's true. Shouldn't be counting my chickens. We still have to get past the woman upstairs. He tenses, his back straightening, his muscles clenching as he's reminded of the obstacle. Hopefully we can just wait her out. If not, he trails off. But his features soften as he once again immerses himself in the film. The man on the screen yells a portent of doom into the camera, trailing off into a wordless scream. The plot is really heating up. I love that there are all these distinct sort of vi vignettes, little pockets of horror that affect a small number of people, and only once you start to see how they fit together you can realize some fundamental horror about the universe. This is like a tie-in of the game here. And then it sees you back. Incredible! Cosmic horror in the truest sense! Reese is becoming very animated. It's probably safe to assume that he's dealing with a lot of extra adrenaline right now. What with his entire reality turning out to be a lie. But he's also talking over the movie. 
more than just something that's changing in Reese. It's everything. There's a knock on the window. Oh. See. He's kind of like already affirming what I'm thinking that Reese is crazy. I mean, this guy's crazy too, but. Jay. Jay. Don't get any closer to that thing. It's time to go home. That voice. I, I know that voice. Is that who's been following you around? Without another word, Wayne starts pounding on the supposedly shatterproof window. Enemies upstairs. Enemies outside. We're surrounded. Even if I get out of this house, I won't be safe. You won't be safe. What do you mean? Wayne isn't going to hurt you. He hasn't hurt anyone. Yes, he will. He's furious with me. Can't you hear it? But I'm not weak anymore. I can fight back. I don't have to cower in fear from people who want to hurt me. I can protect both of us, Jay. The window shatters. As Reese tears at his clothes, paint bubbles from out of the canvases. His ghoulish figures peeling themselves out of the two-dimensional worlds, invading yours, crawling up the walls. Grab my hand. I'll pull you out. Leave us alone! In a surge of violence, the change that has been brewing inside Reese finally comes. As I manifest, the broken basement window is sealed off and Wayne along with it. No, I'm trusting Wayne on this one. You've seen enough to know that you need to leave. You run up the stairs. Oh, help me, Wayne! Help me! <laughs> the door is blocked by a chair. And then it's blocked by something else, too. Oops. I'm tearing through him. If only I had the strength. You toss the chair out of the way and do your best to tear through the paintings covering the door. It reforms and regenerates too quickly for you to claw your way through. Defeated, you turn back to the basement. The remainder of Reese's paintings awaiting their artist's command. It's okay. Stay right there. I can take care of this. Then she won't be able to hurt anyone anymore. I'll be right back. Reese storms up the stairs, leaving you with his smears. Hey, Tabitha. <laughs> hey, where are you? Oh, I'm in hell. Reese is on some kind of rampage. Can you come pick me up? What? Don't move a muscle. I'm coming to get you. Your cousin hangs up the phone. make your way to the door that beckoned you to yesterday. All intrigue now washed away. You know where it leads. You know what secrets the stone that lurked in the forgotten basement of the clinic had to share with you. Now the clinic holds a new horror. Somewhere beyond the narrow hallway leading from the house proper into the doctor's office, there is a monster preparing to do something unthinkable. You grasp the handle and turn. Duck! You do as she says, ducking out of the way. She shoots. The gun isn't very loud. There's only a pop as the projectile leaves the barrel, whizzing through the air. You turn to see a dart embedded in Reese's chest. He pulls the tranquilizer dart out from between his ribs, heaving heavy, heavy breaths as the drug courses through his system. You're going to have to try harder than that, you pip. No! How did you- <gasps> As if you could hope to stop me, you pathetic waste of flesh. Before Wayne takes another step down the stairs, paint flows out between the cracks in the wood, Reese's panic pulling in a mob of furious smears to hold his enemies in place. The artist darts away, but the smears continue their work in his absence. Dr. Kelly makes her escape down the hallway, and Wayne is overcome, glued in place at the top of the stairs by stiffening globs of paint. Can I not just help Wayne? I mean, I'm gonna assume this is helping Wayne. You rush out of the main entryway, taking cover in the first room you see. A few seconds pass. Things are quiet. Hey. Dr. Kelly's voice crackles out of some unseen speaker. You, Jay. I'm stuck in the safe room. I can't help you from here, but you can help the both of us. I'm sure Wayne can handle this. 
Oh yeah, the creeper showed up and was immediately swarmed by those things. I'm sure he's going to be a big help. Look, I know how to deal with my son. I know how to do it non-lethally, so nobody has to die tonight. You're in the med medical storage room, right? I need you to use the black tape key to get into the cabinet and bring me the elephant tranquilizers. It's a bottle labeled car Carfentanil. Bear tranquilizers clearly aren't going to cut it anymore. An intercom system, huh, Doc? Good. You should hear this. Jay, you don't have to do anything, she says. I'm not going to hurt anybody else. Just her. If I don't, you and I both know she's just going to shoot me full of elephant tranquilizers. Did I hear that right? And shove me back down in that basement. Or maybe someplace even worse. Keep killing me every day for the rest of my miserable existence. I feel amazing right now. Better than I've ever felt in my life. I'm not dangerous. She's just scared because she knows she has to finally pay for what she's taken from me. Wayne, help me. <laughs> oh. He's a little tied up at the moment. Not anymore. Reese cries out in pain. Ah, what the hell did you do to my shoulder? You see for the briefest instant something coming out of Wayne's sleeve. Just a flash of pale yellow, then it's gone, slithering back into Wayne's clothes. I'll handle it. Just try to get somewhere safe until then. The two stagger off down the hallway. Quick, grab the tranquilizers and head to the safe room. Yeah, sure, I'll grab him. Do as she says. The tranquilizers are easy to find, marked with a small square of black tape to match the key. She's certainly an organized woman. You make your way out of the medical storage room and back to the hallway where Dr. Kelly disappeared. As you approach, Dr. Kelly heaves open the door, slowly breaking apart the mass of paint, sealing it shut. Hurry! I don't think I can keep it open for long. Slip past her into the safe room. She shuts the door quickly and one of the little smears manages to slip past her. She stomps on it. Painted viscera splatters across the cement floor. Sounds like Reese and your friend are still fighting. We probably have a few minutes before he gets here. What's the game plan, both short-term and long-term? Well, I pump a full of elephant tranquilizers, then I lock him in here, then I somehow convince him to see things from my perspective. And we all live happily ever after. And how's that worked out from four? He's never known the exact nature of his condition before. Maybe it was a mistake to hide it from him. But I thought it meant he could feel like he had more freedom, not knowing if he just stopped taking his pills he could become big and pointy enough to kill me. I'm going to have to revoke some of those freedoms now. He's not going to like that, but I think he'll understand, even if it takes time. I don't think he wants to hurt people. He just can't help what he is. Well, we're at it. Uh, any other secrets you're keeping? Maybe. If we both survive, I might decide to share a few more. If you don't go tattling to anybody. Let's talk, Reese. Yeah, I bet you have some questions. Go ahead. I have nothing left to hide. Well, what'd you find out? A little after he hit puberty. He had all the usual changes, except then a few extra. Thickened nails, sharp teeth, elfish ears. I figured he might have some kind of genetic disorder. Had him checked out a few specialists, but there was nothing obviously wrong with him. Then we had an argument, and he changed, right in front of me. It was nothing like what he is now, just a couple inches and some facial abnormalities, enough to be noticeable. I was scared. He could see that, and he stopped. I thought it was a one-off, or maybe a hallucination. But the second time, it wasn't as subtle, and it didn't go away that easy. That's when I knew for sure that this was something beyond my realm of expertise. Why'd you start poisoning him? She sighs. We stop calling it poison. Yes, it's poison, but the act of me giving him poison was not me poisoning him. I was medicating his illness. It started when he was around 15. I'd been giving him increasingly high doses of clon clonopin, but his body kept adapting and his symptoms would come back easily, especially if he ever fought. I couldn't keep ordering all those drugs. It was already suspicious, and I could risk losing my license, especially if anyone ever found out what I was using them for. Someone approached me with a solution. I took it. It was Sybil. And I've been dealing with the emotional and mental consequences of that decision ever since. Yeah, it's Sybil. Who approached you and what did they say? Dr. Kelly gives you a long, hard look. I don't want to talk about that woman. Yeah. But screw it. I might die tonight. Sure. I'll tell you. It was... Oh. And that's all I have to say about that. Yeah. And you know, I mean, I really feel like she's got something going on, huh? 
and she like told me to come here knowing that this would probably happen. How uh, do you know he's dangerous? Well, he wants to murder me, so that's clue number one. It's not like he's usually a violent kid. He's mostly just sat, but every now and then we butt heads, and that's usually when this side of him comes out. Imagine if this happens anytime he gets frustrated with anyone. Imagine he gets road rage one day, turns into a 12-foot monster with a million teeth, and rips somebody apart in the middle of a major metropolitan area. Yeah, he's dangerous. What you're doing is difficult, but it's necessary. I'm glad you see it. it. Makes me feel a little less cruel. It hasn't been easy doing all this to him, but I know it's for the best, for him and for everyone else. Was his dad, uh, similar? A strange little smile creeps onto Dr. Kelly's face. I wish I knew. This just kinda happened. I wasn't seeing anyone. I just woke up pregnant one day. I know how impossible that sounds. I'm a doctor, for Christ's sake. I kept having these weird dreams, almost like sleep paralysis episodes. Romantic sleep paralysis episodes. They're actually kinda sweet, but they were just dreams. But then, all of a sudden, my period stopped. I got morning sickness, and roughly nine months later, Reese. What is he? <laughs> First I thought he was some kind of werewolf. But if he is, he doesn't follow any kind of full moon rules or anything. Silver doesn't do shit to him, and you see what it looks like. It's just weird. I almost wish I could examine him while he's fully transformed. I'd be fascinated to know what happens to him, or how his body does it. But he seems pretty hellbent on ripping my throat out, so I guess that'll have to remain a mystery. Yeah, we're gonna leave it at that. What is this room? Old x room. Lead walls. After I realized this whole situation was a possibility, I had the door reinforced with special remote-controlled locks. Glad it could finally come in handy. You and Dr. Kelly sit in silence and wait for her son to make his way to you. The sound of distant breaking glass cuts through the silence of clinic outside the safe room. Shit. This might be game time. Dr. Kelly opens the door. The two of you stare out into the hallway. Is this what you were so afraid of? Hand over the tranquilizers. This is our shot. <gasps> Tabitha! <laughs> Before the Dr. Kelly can fire, a different shot rings out. Reese's body is thrown to the wall. Shotgun in hand, your cousin rounds the corner and trains her weapon on his writhing body. Tabitha, what are you doing here? Stop it! Let me sedate him! We can deal with this non-lethally! Are you insane? That thing was trying to kill you! Finish him off, Tabitha. End this. You two, help me drag this thing outside. We're burning it. The three of you stand around Reese's mangled, still twitching body. You can see the ways he's trying to stitch himself back together. The tendrils of flesh meeting and joining. The clicks and pops of bones snapping back together. And the horrific wet sounds of meat resealing around... Ruined edges. Your cousin pours gasoline over his body. Then she lights a match. He screams as he erupts into flames. It's inhuman, the ruin of his face incapable of making any recognizable sounds beyond a guttural wail. It seems to last forever, and then it stops. In its absence, there is only the roaring of flames and the sobbing of his mother staring down at the writhing, burning body of what was once her son. I always knew there was something off about that kid. He had a weird smell. Before she can push you away, you wrap your cousin in your arms and squeeze. She sighs, patting you on the back, a stunning display of affection from someone as cold as Tabitha. You release her, and she steps back, putting her usual distance between the two of you. She even hugged me when I was stinky. Did you know what he was? No, but the door was sealed shut, and I got a bad vibe from your call, so I took the gun from my office. I was already armed when I rounded the corner and just saw him, just did what had to be done. Thanks for calling instead of trying to handle this on your own. You make a good team. No one says a word. The three of you standing in silent agreement, only the crackling of Reese's corpse filling the quiet and empty clearing. I'm sorry, Joan. An acrid smell hangs in the air, the stink of burning flesh stinging your natural nostrils. But he's gone. 
There's only a charred pile of ashen bone where his writhing body once lay. Nothing moves. Nothing tries to mend itself. There is nothing left to be mended. I'm going to bed. Not a word of this to anyone, or there will be hell to pay. You don't have to tell me twice. Whoops. Again. <laughs> Dr. Kelly starts back down the hill towards the clinic, leaving the two of you next to the smoldering ashes. I'm parked down the hill. Let's get out of here. I need a shower. My hair smells like burning corpse. The two of you make your way to the bottom of the hill, where Tabitha's car is parked among the sleepy houses of Scarlet Hollow's residential street. She places her gun in the trunk and turns to face you. You're alone right now. Every other time you've gotten into trouble, Stella's been with you. Where is she? She's been missing since last night. She what? Why didn't you tell me? I shouldn't have let her run off like that. What was I thinking? God, forget it. Let's just go home. We'll look for her tomorrow. You and Tabitha quietly return to the estate, both of you impossibly exhausted by the day's events. I've got a crash. I'll see you tomorrow. She heads to bed without another word. Okay. Well, fine. Exhausted beyond belief, you stumble into your room and collapse on the bed. As your eyes sink, you realize that something smells off about the room. It smells rotten. Oh, hey. I'm glad Wayne's okay. You jolt awake as the door creaks. Don't look so frightened. I was just going to say goodnight. And to give you a word of advice, Tabitha won't be around tomorrow. Too busy at the mines. Forbidden places won't be forbidden without her there to stop you. And you might be surprised at what you find. Until then, sleep well. Wait! Wayne pauses at the door. Yes? I'm glad you're okay. I was worried Reese might have... Wayne emits a strange kind of coughing sound. He realizes he's laughing. He managed to cough me out, catch me off guard. Those constructs of hers were an interesting little trick, but that's all they were. Did you know Reese was like that? I knew he was different. How exactly, I wasn't sure, but now I know. I thought you wanted me to stay at the estate. Aren't you going to lecture me? You were free to make your own decisions, and those decisions have been made. I know that something pulls at you, and I know now that you cannot stop until your task is finished. I'll keep you safe while you do what you must. Thanks for looking out for me tonight. Anytime you find yourself in danger, I'll be there for you. I will always be there for you. Do you know what happened to Stella? She ran off, didn't she? Remember that. If you find her, she won't be there if you need her. Good night, Jay. Wayne leaves her room and closes the door behind him. The damp smell of the mattress is starting to become almost welcoming. A sign that the now daily horrors of Scarlet Hollow are finally behind you, at least until the sun inevitably rises once again. Close your eyes, your exhausted body succumbing to the sleep almost immediately. As you drift off, you think of Reese and the way his mangled but still living body writhed in his funeral pyre. And then you think of nothing. And that is the end of chapter 4. I'll be waiting a minute for chapter 5, but... Oh, I guess there was a I got a little achievement pop up that says finish episode four without finding Stella. So I'm curious how that would have changed things. I wonder if, you know, Wayne kind of implied that she wouldn't be there to protect me. So maybe I don't know how much Wayne actually protected me there. It seems like Tapitha did all the heavy lifting, but <laughs> I'm interested to see how it goes. Um, we might just kind of go scorched earth on everybody but the Scarlets. That seems the kind of the way we're going. I'm assuming Wayne is, well, Tabitha said he was his ex, but it also seems like he's like a family member. So maybe she knows that and that's why they're exes now. I don't know, something weird, but you know, it's supposed to be weird, right? Well, we'll figure it out in a couple months in episode five. But for now, I'll see you later.